Should you be opting for a two year fixed or five year fixed, knowing the state of the economy is in? Uh, what if you're self employed? What if you work in a risky sector? What should you be doing? Um, we'll touch on this on this video. We'll also to, uh, look at some of the uh, questions, key questions I get from my existing clients and people that watch the videos. Questions like, you know, what mortgage I'm on? Um, what did I opt to do? What did I do um, in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the business, my own risk factor? How did I lose weight? I mentioned in my other video what I did about losing weight and what I why I lost weight and what I did about it. Most people are going, never mind all your boring mortgage stuff. Tell us how you lost weight. So I'm going to talk about that. So keep tuned and I'll catch you on the video. Hello everybody, it's Payam here from Niche Advice. Hope you're all well. In this episode, we're going to talk about a really important question, which is, should you go for a two-year fix or a five-year fix? Now, I've covered this subject before in the past, but things have changed so much, it's become more and more important to differentiate between these two uh, choices, really. Now, that's to do with people that are looking to purchase a property, but also people that have got remortgages coming up. So um, things have changed. We're going to talk about some of the things that people should consider. Um, this is not advice. Uh, this is just information pieces. Like all of my videos, everything is tailor-made. Everything is individual to your circumstances. But what I want to do is give you some food for thought there. So you are thinking about these things as you're looking to make this decision. And it's a really important decision because at the moment, nobody knows whether th where things are going to be. So uh, this is going to be just focused on the residential front. Uh, buy till it's a little bit more complicated because of the way you have to work out rental calculations. Um, and, and try to stick around till the end. And what I'll do is I'll try to answer some live questions that I've had certainly in the last couple of, uh, couple of days in regards to this choice from my own live clients. So uh, uh, this is not as, you know, uh, you know I I'll be running through some live cases. Um, I've also uh, taken some time to actually do some research for you and work out the best rates right now. So we will base this on le real live rates of, you know, the best two year fixes, depending on the loan to values. So whether you've got 95% mortgage, 90% mortgage, 85% mortgage, 75% mortgage and 60% mortgage. So basically we've looked at the best rates on a two year fixed and five year fixed. So we can actually give it some real sort of in-depth sort of uh, uh, look at things. Um, now these rates will change. Uh, this is for information purposes only, but just give you a guideline of what decisions are being made, what are people doing about things and how you should be thinking about it. Right. So I'm going to put the rates up there now. So as you can see, uh, there's not that much difference. The first thing is, when I did this video, and I've, I've done a video, if you put this subject in there, I think I did the video about a year and a half ago, there was a big difference between a two-year fixed and a five-year fixed in terms of rates. Okay, So it could have been, I don't know, one and a half percent maybe difference between uh, going with a two-year, and normally two years was cheaper than a five-year, because five-year you were committing more. Um, and there was a big difference in things. But having a look at these rates now, <coughs> I mean, look at it. Uh, let's take, I don't know, someone with 10% deposit on a two-year fixed. It's 3.85, the best product there. And I have done some research on this, and I've got quite a lot of uh, calculations behind the scenes. I'm not just doing this for the sake of doing it. Uh, and then a five-year fixed. Look at it. Uh, look at the one with 15% deposit. Not much difference between a two years and a five years. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us, first of all, that the banks are nervous. Uh, the banks, uh, short term, they don't know what's going on, so they're pricing themselves higher, um, looking to build in risk, um, but they don't believe it's going to go haywire in, in the next five years because, you know, the, the rates are what they are. Um, certainly for short term, though, if you look at it, they don't really want to be lending a lot of short term money. Um, now, you know, the caveat here is we're just talking about fixes, really. So uh, I've picked the most common ones, a two-year fix and a five-year fix. There are discount rates. There are variable rates. There are tracker rates, which we're going to see more of now, right? Especially at the two-year money so expensive. So, you know, don't just be full. Just that's your option. But those type of deals, um, 
there's a there's a more of a specific need there's a reason why someone's going for a tracker rate because they might want to sell the property that they want an early repayment charge and so forth so i've just stuck with these two years two year and five year products um, notice there's not much three year action going on and that's the typical of the market in fact many lenders don't actually have a three year fix and sometimes i get clients come back to me and say well I'm not sure about a two year and I'm not sure about five year. Can I have a three year? And then they'll look at it because there's not much choice out there. Not many lenders doing three year products. It's not that competitive. Um, <clears throat> so we learn something from here. One, we learn for someone who's got a big deposit, you know, 40% deposit and someone who's got a 10% deposit. For the first time, and I've been doing this for a very long time, so I've certainly been in the industry for 20 years, and we've been brokering, myself I've been brokering probably for the last 13 odd years. This is the, this is the first time that I've seen such a, um, not much of a gap between someone who's, been, who's got a big deposit and someone who doesn't have a big deposit. Um, typically, let's look at the one with 15% deposit and someone with 40% deposit. There's not much, not that much in it, you know. You're not when you when you look at the repayments on a monthly between a 3.62 and a 3.85. There's not that much in it, so it's really strange how people with greater levels of deposit are being penalised. Now, this will have a big bearing on the remortgages that are coming up. Okay, so people always felt secure and said, "Well, I've got 40, 50, 60 percent equity. I should get the best rate," and that was always the case. And although you are still getting the best rate. There's not that much in it with someone who's got 15% deposit or 15% equity in the deal. So um, this gives you an idea about that. Now, what do you consider when you start making a decision, right? First of all, I think it's two different sort of uh, thought processes for people that are purchasing than people that are remortgaging. Because the people that are remortgaging, they've already bought the property, they know what the property is like, they know they may not have any, so sort of, the boiler may not go on it, or the windows have already been done, and there's no major cost associated with it. So they may have a different strategy to someone who's going to buy a property, and then may have to encounter some more costs, right? And what we know at the moment, with this world that we live in, is there are certain things that are out of control. Utilities are out of our control right now, okay? Health problems are potentially out of our control. There are certain things that are out of our control, right? So the more things we can get right in terms of having control over, having some projections over, the better it is in this environment. So the people that are purchasing, I've got to look and go, right, I'm in this situation right now. Maybe let's take the person who's got 15% deposit, right? <clears throat> I'm going to buy a property. I've got a choice of a two-year or a five-year fixed. I've already determined what term I'm going to go for, 20, 25, 30 years. So I've already worked that out. But now I need to know what I'm going to do on a two or a five-year. So <clears throat> it's really where you think you are in your life, okay? So I'll give you an example. If you are someone who's young, who is maybe a professional or someone who's just gone into a job and they believe their career is on the up, okay? So they believe in two years' time they will be in a stronger position than now um, or in two years' time they may want to upgrade or they may want to move or they want to build a family or stuff like that. That's when the two-year option is a little bit better, okay? But if you are cautious and you think, right, this is the house that I'm buying and I'm going to be here for a while, and you know what? I might have a kid soon. Um, there's going to be other costs that, you know, are going to put a strain on my finances. Then people tend to go with the five-year fixed option because, you know, you're building some, uh, you're being cautious. You're building some resilience. So should something happen, you don't necessarily want to go back to a lender to say, look, I've had twins. And now, by the way, I've got nursery costs and I've got this, I've got that. So you've got to think, where are you right now and where are you going to be in the next five years, right? Where is your savings going to be? Where's your job going to be? Where's your income going to be? Where's your expenses going to be? What's your family structure going to be? Are you going to receive inheritance, for example, okay? Are you going to be selling any assets? Do you think your stocks and shares will get better? Do you think... So all of those things will have a bearing on where you think you will be. But... At the end of the day, right now, there's not much in it, okay? So then you have to look at also, let's look at five-year deals. Just because I've put five-year deals, I haven't put 
the early repayment charges. So on a two year deal, you've got two, two years worth of early repayment charges if you wanted to get out. On a five year deal, you've got early repayment charges. Now the typical five year fixed is 5%, 4%, 3%, 2%, 1%. That's the early repayment charge, right? There are some lenders that have got 5% flat out. In fact, I got stung with this a few years ago when I sold uh, one of my buy to lets and it had a 5% early repayment charge throughout the mortgage and I think I sold it in four year four but I still had to pay the five percent so again so if that's a concern to you then bring that up with your mortgage broker discuss that because it could be an option also what's very important and I get quite a lot of this is I might buy the property but I might want to rent it out later on uh, say in a few years time and upgrade uh, however I want to keep this property so if that's the case it, it may make sense for you to put it on a five-year fix go with a lender that will allow you to rent that property should your circumstances change it's called consent to let okay so that gives you an option that flexibility right so the key is discuss it with your broker if there is things that the need to be told you know these are the things that you need to discuss so is your circumstance going to change now when we're talking about a remortgage it's a little bit different because you know what you're getting right and you could be a little bit more um, adventurous because you know some of the costs involved uh, right now everybody wants to be cautious everyone I mean I would say the predominant most of our cases are going on a five-year fixed I would say majority of them um, and the reason for that is people want to know where they sit and maybe they want that breathing space for five years to be able to repay some of that mortgage. Take advantage of that 10% overpayment. That's really important. Everybody should be taking advantage of the 10% overpayment if you can make it work. Um, set up a direct debit for a higher amount and let that to be up to 10% of your mortgage balance um, every year and try to reduce that mortgage balance. Take advantage of it and reduce it so when you know when you come out at the other end, um, you know, you might not be in their stronger position. You might have a, have a couple of kids by then. So what you want to do is you want to put your affordability um, in the strongest position. However, there are some lenders out there, Santander being one of them, I think Nationwide's another one, where they're actually, if you're doing a like-for-like -like remortgage, their affordability is more generous. I think it's five and a half times income, okay, on a like-for-like, so if you're not looking to capital raise on a remortgage. So that's really useful, okay? So if you've had some changes happen along the way, don't just accept what the lender is going to offer you. Always approach a mortgage broker, independent mortgage broker, because they can source the market. Compare what you've been offered to what the mortgage broker can do and often if they're if they're good you may decide to stay for example if if we if i've got a client who i've i don't know let's say they went with x lender and i placed them with x lender and, and in five years time they came back to me or, or five years ago they now come back to me and said look what are my options i always compare them to what they can get offered by their existing lender to what's out there okay and then it may be like okay um you're better off staying where you are and if that's the case I don't charge them I just literally say well I'll do the case for you we'll do the documentation but there's no broker fee involved because you're gonna stay with your own lender and I think that's the fair way to do it but at least you get that comparison we do that research we look at the affordability we look at to see if there's anyone else cheaper because often remortgages come with free valuation free legals so you don't have to worry about the associated cost as much um, so yeah I mean the, the people that would go for a two-year fix at the moment are the people that are very confident that their situation is going to get better, the job opportunity is going to get better, their income is going to go higher, they may have a pay rise, may may have a, a, some level of deposit coming through, and they feel comfortable with their affordability. If affordability is a concern, then you should be going for the more cautious approach because you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I mean, I, I'm making this video today uh, on the 8th of the 9th, 2022. We're just waiting for the new Prime Minister to give their speech around the um, the utilities cap. But who knows where things are going to be? Who knows what will? So if you're worried about that and if you think that, you know, things might get more tight, then you would probably be more cautious. And at least although the five year fixed is there, um, I would probably take the five years. But you know everything's for themselves but if you look at it at the moment you've got to have a real specific need to go two years otherwise there's not much difference between a two and a five year um, I hope you found this useful guys it is you will need advice you will need to look at the circumstances try to take some of this information that I've given on board 
and, and really look at where you think you're going to be, where your family structure is going to be, where your finances are going to be. If you're going to go and buy that Tesla on, you know, uh, on finance, you know, how's that going to affect your affordability? If you're going to go and buy a furniture for your property, if you're going to pay for a new boiler, all of those things will have a bearing on this choice. And it's a choice that all of us have to make. I'll give an example. I did one. I fixed mine. Um, uh, I did two and a half years ago, I think three years ago. Now I did a five year fixed. Okay. Now, for the first two years, I was actually kicking myself saying, well, interest rates were 1% and I think I fixed in at 1.59 at the time. So I was thinking, oh my God, I've, I'm a mortgage broker and I've actually not done it the right way. You know, however, now that 1.59, you know, if you look at it, uh, it, it looks pretty good right now. So sometimes you win some uh, and it, or sometimes you lose some and you think, oh my God, I've made the wrong decision but it may turn out to be a good decision. And in my case, my, my mortgage comes up in about two years time. So I've still fixed on a 1.59 rate. So, you know, where I lost that initially, I'll probably gain that back. Um, so I was more cautious um, in regards to it because mainly I think um, I was worried about the economy. I actually thought interest rates were going to rise two years ago before COVID. Um, and I was adamant and I made videos and I said, it needs to rise. It has to rise. Otherwise, inflation is just going to go mad. Obviously, I'm not the governor uh, of the Bank of England and then they decided, well, we had COVID to be fair and COVID sort of ruined everything. Otherwise, I think interest rates would have risen. Um, looking at what's coming out of the markets, looking at what's happening in China, looking at what's happening in the US, I think interest rates are going to rise further. Um, I don't know what the state of the play is going to be in two years time or five years time, but I certainly know in the next year, I think interest rates will still have to rise further to try to cool this market down. I'll catch you on the next one. Let me know what you think. Let me know about your decisions, whether you went for a two-year fix, the five-year fix in the in the past, um, and then and then we'll take it from there. Oh yes, I forgot. So some people wanted a that I had a couple of questions from clients, right? So one of them was actually, did you, are you on a two-year fix or five-year fix? I think I've answered that one. Um, I've got another one. Um, if, if I was going to buy a buy-to-let property, um, would you do it on an interest only or a, would you do it on a repayment? Um, that's, an input, that's, a, that's, a, that's a video by itself. Um, I can tell you that mine are on an interest only um, because my strategy is I want that debt to continue. Um, I want to take the surplus income and I'm putting it towards my residential mortgage. So I'm using that 10% overpayment facility to bring down my residential mortgage because I feel that I want to fix the roof above my head first and then I will look to reduce those loans down later. So that's what I'm doing about it. But everybody's different. Everyone's got a different strategy. Uh, and also it depends on what sort of rates you're on on the buy to let side of things. Certainly buy to lets becoming very expensive. And uh, you know, the, the quotes that I'm doing are, are quite pricey. Uh, another one is in regards to self employed, what do you think self employed people um, should do in regards to a two year or five year fix? Well, self employed, again, that goes on the more riskier sort of thing, because you know, you don't know, you're not set. Now, there is a argument, okay? Now, this is what the lenders are saying. The lenders are saying, well, self-employed people are more risky. But, you know, you could be employed and they, your employer could turn around and say, do you know what, I don't need you anymore. Here's your redundancy. Here's six months' money. See you later. Bye. Um, in another way, self-employed people have got more control because you could see it coming, okay? At least you can see it coming. You see your cash flow. You know what your business you're doing. Um, I would stay on the cautious side with the self-employed people uh, and, and certainly um, I think where we're going to be is if you're in a sector which is to do with, um, which is, you know, if you're in luxury goods, for example, if you're in things, if you, work, if, you know, if you work for Netflix, if you work for anything that could be cancelled, okay, anything that is disposable income, if you're in the hospitality sector, if you are in, I don't know, marketing, you know, if you're in, hey, there are certain sectors that will always take the brunt of any recession or any tightening, okay? If you're in one of those sectors and you're self-employed, I would go down the cautious route, okay? Because it all comes down to where you think you're going to be in the future, okay? And all, if your business, you think it's going to boom, but if you're in that sector, which is susceptible to market volatility, uh, like mortgage brokering, funny enough, Okay, so although mortgage brokering, you can have, uh, you know, rates go up, you'll have remortgage business, rates go down, you'll have lots of purchase business, uh, a recession happens, you'll have lots of debt consolidation and refinancing and stuff like that. However, it's still susceptible to the market. Okay, so, um, uh, you know, that, that's, uh, that's an important point there. Um, 
The next point is, Payam, how did you lose weight? Okay, well, I'm, at the end of my last video, and thank you so much for some of those people that stuck around. If you stuck around to this point, let me know in the comments below, right? So, um, I mentioned very briefly that I was diagnosed four and a half months ago with diabetes, okay? Um, it was about five months ago now. And I decided not to take the medication, not to take their advice, essentially, and go down my own route. And my own route was watching a lot of YouTube videos, lots of YouTube videos, and lots of doctors and lots of health videos and diet videos and so forth. And I read a, a number of books, the blood sugar diet I went on. The first month I was just dieting myself. Then I went on this blood sugar diet, which was basically eight weeks of at 800 calories a day, okay? It's quite substantial, it's quite drastic change. You have to shock your system. And I started losing weight. So I think I've lost about two and a half stone. It's about 17 kilos now. And um, I've stopped it now. I've sta stabilized it. I stopped it about a month and a half ago. And I went for my blood test and everything has been normal. So I'm not even classed as pre-diabetic. It was literally, it's now normal. Okay, so it's in remission. Um, but with diabetes, the way you learn about it and insulin resistance, there's so much to it. Okay, I've actually set up a TikTok account. Okay, and I think it's called Reverse Diabetes. Just to let others know about what I did. Okay, if I can help anybody do the same, you know, that's what I would love to do because um, there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of things people are being told by, but frankly, the NHS is behind, okay? They'd rather give you tablets rather than, you know, help you actually not get into a rut. All you do is with tablets, you just have to take more and more and more and more and more. And, and I think there was a better way and, and there are people that have proven there are better ways and that's what I did. So that's what I did with my weight loss. Uh, let me know, seriously, if you have got stuck around, because you know the way with YouTube videos, when you look at the stats, right, a lot of the people will start watching it and say halfway through, the, they, they'll stop, okay? It's, I'm, it, mortgages are boring, let's be honest. It's boring subject, right? So a lot of it stops. But there is a hardcore that stick right to the end. So if you're one of the hardcore that stuck through the boring stuff, let me know. Thank you so much. I'll catch you on the next one. Take care. The content of this video does not constitute giving advice. It's purely for information purposes. All cases should be discussed with a professional mortgage broker. As a mortgage is secured against your home or property, it could be repossessed if you do not keep up mortgage payments. Niche advice is authorized and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority.